Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to today's members webinar. Now, today we're going to be covering some of the intricacies of tuning on methanol fuel. Now, it's not a fuel that we come across every day. It's uh, almost solely reserved for a very few areas of motorsport, particularly uh, import drag racing or drag racing in general, I should say. Uh, anything with high boost tends to favour methanol fuel. But as we move into our webinar in a few moments, we'll find out exactly why that's the case. What the those fuel properties are and what you need to understand if you are going to be tuning on methanol fuel. Before we do dive into that though, just an update on what's been going on around HPA labs over the last week and uh, we're gradually creeping back into work as the country sort of comes out of our lockdown. So that's positive, we're looking forward to getting the rest of the staff back in the shop later on this week. Uh, Brandon's been beavering away pretty hard on our FDRX7 project so I'll just jump across to my laptop screen for a moment here and uh, talk about what's going on in our engine bay. So probably if you've been watching for a while you've probably already seen some of this, I've talked about some of these components but this is the final assembly of some of our hot side components in particular. Our Borg Warner EFR 8474 turbocharger is in place for the final time, everything's torqued down. Uh, we've got our turbo smart wastegates all mounted up for the final time onto our turbo and uh, investment cast stainless exhaust manifold so good to have that finalised and in place. Uh, Brandon as I mentioned last week had been busy working out a mount for the drive-by-wire throttle actuator so that was going to be mounted down here off the uh, air conditioning bracket and in fact while it's probably a bit hard to see uh, that is exactly the case there we've got that all in for the final time and every fits, everything fits nicely. Got the uh, Vinifab V-mount intercooler set up also in there for the final time so starting to get a little bit exciting. Now while Brandon has sorted out at this point the mounting for the drive-by-wire throttle actuator the other aspect with the drive-by-wire conversion of course is the throttle pedal. And uh, this is the factory Mazda FDRX7 throttle pedal, just a plastic mechanism uh, that bolts to the firewall, obviously inside of the cabin, no big surprises there. We'll just jump to our overhead shot here. And uh, what we needed to do, uh, I say we, but really Brandon takes all of the uh, kudos for this one, was somehow adapt a drive-by wire pedal into its place. So you can see that there are two mounting holes here, uh, a pretty unique shape where it locates into the cabin as well. Now there are a variety of options when it comes to converting to drive-by-wire throttle and some people use uh, something like a linear potentiometer uh, on the factory pedal. Some considerations there for a safety aspect, uh, drive-by-wire systems always use two sensors at both the throttle pedal as well as the throttle body so this is kind of a redundancy basically if those two signals don't match what the ECU is expecting it thinks something's wrong so using a single linear potentiometer can be problematic. There are dual channel options there but we decided the easiest way to go about this was to simply source uh, something that had already been done for us which is a GM drive-by-wire throttle actuator or throttle pedal assembly. Uh, so this makes it easy, it's got everything there done, it's already well tested, it's proven, all we need to do is get a ma mating connector. Problem of course is uh, finding a way to easily adapt this up so it bolts in place and again this is where uh, Brandon came into play with our 3D printer so he uh, designed a bit of a model there which we can see, 3D printed this up as a prototype and it bolts in so we can actually test how it fits. Now we actually found that this worked out to be great, not only did it fit but we did, we did find a, a small problem that we needed to address and that was the height of the throttle pedal assembly. It's probably going to be a little bit hard to see but uh, essentially if we put these side by side uh, what you can see is that the uh, drive-by-wire pedal assembly actually sits quite a bit higher than the factory FDRX7 assembly. So in essence this mount that Brandon designed, uh, first go it was probably a little bit too thick and while it would have worked what it did do was make the spacing between the brake pedal and the throttle pedal uh, just a little bit out which means that when we tested it, once you've got your foot on the brake a little bit the height of the accelerator pedal versus the brake pedal meant that it was going to be all but impossible to accurately heel and toe. So uh, while we're doing this webinar he's printing out a revised version of that uh, model 
bottle and we'll be able to test that before we get it made in something a little bit more resilient than plastic. Another aspect that we are wanting to consider with this as well is uh, adding in a positive stop at the end of the, the pedal travel. Uh, I don't necessarily say that it's an absolute essential. Uh, there is essentially a positive stop as part of this assembly right here. Uh, but obviously uh, if the driver gets a little bit excited then uh, it's possible to end up bending or doing damage to that system. So uh, a lot of drive-by-wire throttle systems will actually have a positive stop on the the floor that the pedal comes into contact with making sure that it doesn't matter how hard the driver presses he's not going to end up with any damage to that assembly so pretty close there I will also jump back to my laptop screen and uh, we also updated the uh, the cooling system a little bit and uh, this is more aesthetics really than anything, just uh, we're a little bit fussy. Uh, so we ended up having Vinny Fab make us up one of these swirl pots to replace the factory cast item. Uh, these are actually an item I'm pretty sure Vinny Fab have now added to their off the shelf packages as well. So if anyone does want one, they can source them from Vinny Fab. Uh, we have chosen to go with AN fittings for all of our cooling system as well. And again, uh, that's just a personal preference. It's, it's not something that you have to do, but we wanted something that was sort of a, a bit more race inspired there so that's what we've gone with on that front. Uh, so we're probably still a couple of weeks away at this stage I think from being able to put the final sort of touches on that car but it is getting dangerously close and looking forward to firing it up for the first time and getting it loaded up onto the dyno. Now the other aspect I wanted to talk about today is our Subaru STI. So we have had this car for a fair while, it's a 2008 version 11 STI, relatively stock and we've been using it for some of our tuning webinars, in particular it's had a healthy Elite 2500 ECU wired into it. We've also got it up and running on an ECU Master Black which we're going to be doing some course material on shortly but one thing we've been asked for quite frequently over the years is some information on uh, reflashing. So we are going to cover reflashing using open source on this particular car. Specifically we're going to be using the ECU flash package for reading, writing and editing. Uh, we're also using ROM Raider for logging so it's going to be perfect for any of you out there who want to learn how to reflash Subaru vehicles. While ours is a version 11 this technique basically covers the entire range down to the earlier 2000 uh, version 7 so basically any Subaru vehicle that is supported you'll learn within that uh, course uh, worked example how to cover that. There are a couple of intricacies that I just wanted to deal with here that I, I think are, is easy to overlook a lot of people don't know that this problem exists and it's a problem with the fuel system that uh, existed in stock form and uh, Subaru and their infinite wisdom rather than really addressing the core issue uh, addressing the fuel system itself they just put a big old dirty band-aid on it in the software so I'll just jump into my laptop screen again for a second and this is the engine bay here and really not too exciting it's all relatively stock here uh, but it's all to do with the way the fuel system runs and in the boxer engine we've got a fuel rail runs down here and a fuel rail runs down here uh, it's to do with the way the fuel pressure is regulated and we've um, got some problems around uh, high frequency pulsations in that fuel system. So what this can do is cause some uh, some inconsistencies in the fueling which can be a little bit hard to deal with if you don't know they're there. Uh, so we'll just jump across to uh, my laptop here I've got an article this is uh, actually from Cobb's website so uh, if you are interested in learning more about this if you search on Cobb's website you'll be able to find this and this covers the fuel system problems and they've understandably come up with an upgrade here for these parts but uh, basically this little histogram here shows the issue. This is a histogram of the uh, fuel trims versus our engine RPM and our ma uh, mass airflow voltage. So uh, what we'd expect to see in a well-tuned engine uh, is under closed loop conditions the fuel trim should be very very close to zero and at least should be pretty consistent. And what we can see here is that if we look at one slice of this uh, particular column here, the 2.4 volts for example, uh, we can see that as our RPM increases, initially down around 2200-2500 RPM, uh, the trims are very very close to zero, we're about 1.5%. However we get up to 3200 RPM, 3400 RPM and all of a sudden we see those jump up to 13, 12, 13% 13%, which is significant. 
Now, this causes a problem because when we are reflashing a factory ECU that relies heavily on the mass airflow sensor, it's really the mass airflow sensor scaling that we would normally and typically clean up these sorts of errors with or inside of. And basically what we're looking at is the voltage that the, the mass airflow sensor is reporting to the ECU is then converted into a mass airflow number in terms of grams per second or uh, pounds per minute, it doesn't really matter. And that's what the ECU then uses to decide how much fuel to deliver in order to get a specific air fuel ratio. So the problem with this is when in this particular instance we're sitting at the same voltage out of the mass airflow sensor. This means that the mass airflow sensor is reporting the same airflow going into the engine but if we look at what the closed loop trims are doing they're all over the place. At one point uh, particularly at low RPM they're pretty close to zero we'd be really happy with that but we get up to 3200 RPM and all of a sudden they're very very positive. Now this happens even in a completely stock vehicle and this is noticeable because the cars tend to be a little bit erratic and hesitant, uh, particularly around that 2800 to 3400 RPM range, particularly in light throttle crews. Easy to notice when you're logging what's happening or you've got a wideband fitted, but again, even in a stock vehicle, this exists and it gets worse when you fit larger injectors. It basically amplifies the problem. Now, I'm not here as an advert for Cobb. They have got a fix and I'll just show you if we scroll down. Uh, this is basically the end result once they've applied their fuel system fix, which is a bunch of hardware components basically addressing the fuel pressure control in the system. And we can see that everything's now lining up pretty much what we'd expect from a well-tuned uh, ECU. So again, if you don't know about this, it can become problematic. And what I want to do is just jump over to ECU Flash here and show you what we've got to deal with. So a lot of tables here in ECU Flash, the main ones that we're going to be looking at or interested in for this perspective is our mass airflow and engine load tables. And uh, most of what we would normally do is in our MAF sensor scaling table. So that's what we've got here. So this is the table that the ECU uses to convert between a voltage out of the mass airflow sensor and a mass airflow in this case in grams per second. It's really important with this table when it's tuned properly we want to maintain a nice smooth exponential shape to it just like we've got there. And again this gets pretty tricky because in that example that I showed you from Cobb with the logging basically we're at one fixed voltage in that case I think it was 2.4 volts we're looking at so in our particular instance it's reporting 34.59 grams per second of air. And we can't change that relative to RPM if we change what it's reporting at 2.4 volts, it's changing it everywhere. So we can't fix the problem in one place without making it worse in the other. So this is how Subaru dealt with this in their infinite wisdom. What they did is they included a couple of tables here which are called engine load compensation tables. So we'll bring one of these up. Now this is a weird looking three dimensional table uh, and it uses RPM on one axis which we've got here and instead of our normal load being grams per revolution or grams per cylinder uh, it's got manifold pressure on the vertical axis. So we can have a look at this table and we can see in particular it's all over the show. Specifically we can see around this area here at about 2800 to 3000 RPM we've got trims of 21, 15% in there uh, and then then we go higher and lower we drop back to very close to zero. So this is how Subaru fixed this problem and it is a big old dirty band-aid at best but this is sometimes what OE manufacturers do. Problem is why I bring all of this up is that if you don't understand that this table is here, if you don't understand that it may need some attention when you are tuning, uh, then you're going to pull your hair out trying to get half decent results because you cannot tune around these problems solely in the mass airflow sensor scaling. Otherwise you're just going to end up with a huge mess on your hands. So uh, I'm about halfway through filming the worked example on that. We obviously dive deep into this topic as well as a range of other uh, specific topics, basically everything you'll need to know in order to re reflash one of those vehicles from start to finish making sure you get great results so just thought it'd be interesting to show you some of the weird stuff that uh, factory or OE engineers end up doing uh, as a workaround to some of the problems that we do see. Uh, now I also wanted to just mention this is, we'll jump across to my laptop screen, this is an Instagram we put up a little while ago now but I just wanted to readdress it, this is from back in April, uh, but this is a problem that I do see quite a lot, so the picture at the moment that we've got here is actually from a Honda B18C turbo engine that I tuned back through my old workshop, so this is probably going on towards 10 or 12 years ago now. Uh, so basically the backstory on this, it was a built Honda B18C turbo engine and 
and as with a lot of Hondas, the owner of the vehicle had purchased a cheap uh, lightweight alloy crank pulley to replace the factory harmonic damper. This is common. Uh, getting rid of weight out of the rotating assembly obviously does give the potential for the engine to rev quicker. Uh, I was in a tuning session, probably done about 10 or 15 pulls on the dyno, and uh, on a full power ramp run, we I ended up hearing a crack and uh, a knocking sound from the engine, immediately backed off the throttle and shut the engine down. Uh, the result was exactly this, we had oil all over the floor and the problem is that the, the oil pump driven gear here basically smashed to pieces, it had broken the front housing and uh, ended up with an oil leak as a result as well. Uh, the upshot for the engine is we also ended up with zero oil pressure which is not exactly what you want at 7000 rpm and probably 400 horsepower at the wheels. Uh, in some miracle that engine actually lived through that, it just required a new oil pump and uh, we're away to the races. So why has this happened? It comes down to this problem of harmonics and this is something I see uh, quite often where people will fit these solid front pulleys thinking that uh, particularly if they've got a built engine they've balanced all of the engine components so a damper, harmonic damper isn't essential. Uh, the reality is they're very very different things and it doesn't matter how well balanced your engine components are internally, it doesn't matter, we're still going to find that in operation we get uh, vibrational twisting in the crankshaft or torsional vibration in the crankshaft as a result of each of the firing uh, strokes, each of the power strokes of the engine and that, that torsional vibration that goes into the crankshaft uh, can cause some pretty significant damage if it's left unchecked. So in stock form this is what the harmonic damper is there for. It's not there to fix an imbalance in your engine, that's a very separate thing, it's there to absorb or reduce those, uh, those harmonics that occur. And where this gets really important is that uh, with any assembly like this there will be certain RPM ranges where there is a resonant frequency uh, that occurs and particularly if we sit at that resonant frequency with no harmonic dampener uh, then this is where those harmonics can absolutely cause catastrophic damage. So this is something that actually ends up being more of a problem in road cars than race cars which is interesting. And the reason for this is that in a road car we tend to sit at constant RPM quite a lot of the time, particularly at cruise, we might be sitting on the open road in top gear at maybe 3000 RPM for extended periods of time. Now if that 3000 RPM that we're sitting at happens to coincide with a resonant frequency, we potentially could be destroying our engine without even knowing it and without even putting any load on it. Uh, so that's the sort of things we do need to consider. On the other hand a race engine generally we don't sit at the same RPM, we're constantly revving through the, the RPM range and while we still want a harmonic damper on that style of engine, uh, often we can live with this and this is why I quite get, often get asked well uh, why has that race car done 10 seasons of racing with no harmonic damper, obviously that means it's fine, uh, that's not the case. So. In this particular post, if you are interested in learning a little bit more, we'll just jump back to the photos here. Uh, this was a, a post we did from uh, SEMA and it was regarding the ATI series uh, super dampers, which is probably one of the more popular ones out there on the market uh, and a little bit of a discussion about how exactly they work. Uh, Alright, last but not least for today, we have just got another one of our giveaways live. So uh, this is for the FuelTech FT550 ECU and also we're adding in our online tuning course package so that you'll know exactly what to do with that particular ECU once you get it up and running. So it has just gone live, I'll get Scott to drop a link into the comments that you can follow if you want to get your name into the drawer. Uh, there's no cost, no risk of getting involved, we will ship this anywhere in the world as well. There are also a few little tasks that you can complete which will give you additional entries into the drawer. So jump on that, FT550, personally not an ECU that we've had the opportunity to use yet. FuelTech in particular are getting uh, some really big recognition out in the drag racing world. We're seeing a lot of uh, drag racing competitors switch across to the FT platform. Uh, some really good successes there. One of the things I do like about it, uh, while I haven't had the opportunity to get one on the dyno, one of the, the things I do like about it is that it essentially is a combined 
ECU uh, dash logger and dash unit dash display. So uh, this also is touch screen. So it allows you to actually make key tuning changes straight from the dash unit. Now, while obviously you're not going to be dialing in your fuel and ignition tables uh, one by one from that dash by hand, uh, this does allow you to make subtle changes to maybe the two step launch RPM or your boost target. Uh, if the track conditions change while you're stuck there in the staging lanes, if you're a drag racing competitor, it means you don't have to run back and get your laptop from the pits. All right, team, uh, thanks for watching. Give us a few moments here and we'll get started with our lesson today. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.